how wonderful for us to, to gather together as a church on uh, this is Pentecost Sunday. So a very important Sunday in the life of the church. You know, it's interesting how we always, we lift up Christmas, we lift up Easter, we always have a big boost of attendance on those days, but this is such a glorious day for the church, amen? This is, this is when God sent us the Holy Spirit to enable us to, to live the story, the life that Christ wants us to, to live. And the uh, kind of the theme of the service is that we want Christ's story to become our story. And because we each have a tale that is to be told, just like all of our compliments and new members, they all have, the Lord has a life for them to live, and we get to be an exciting part of it this morning. And so it's very exciting to be able to be welcoming so many folks into the life of the church, such a large confirmation class, and also to, to uh, welcome uh, new members uh, into the life of the church as well. In both services, we've been able to, to do that. And actually, the praise team had a week off. We have, uh, I was trying to talk with Justin there a little bit, and we may actually, Jennifer, if you're, you're going to be coming in, I'll ask for you to come up front too, if, if that's all right, if you're comfortable doing that. And uh, because, you know, confirmation is usually around 12 years of age or so, but at any time that you join the church by confessing your faith, uh, you're, coming, you're coming really as a child of God. So we'll also have you guys uh, stand with our confirmation class to confess your faith. Everybody turn to uh, page 45. There's a lot of different services that recognize uh, receiving confession of faith, confirmation, and receiving uh, new members. But we're going to use this service today, which is an older book from the Methodist Church and that brother church. And I, I have one additional question that's in the Methodist uh, confession of faith that I want to ask of the kids that uh, make it clear when that comes up. But the Bible, uh, we hear from this service that the churches of God will be preserved to the end of time for the conduct of worship, ministration of God's word and sacraments, maintenance of Christian fellowship and discipline, the edification of believers, the conversion of the world. Everybody, all in every age and station, stand in need of the means of grace which Christ Church alone supplies. And so at this time, I'm going to ask for our, our group to stand. You all stand and have your papers there with you. And then everybody on, on that page 45, I'm going to ask for you to join in on the Apostles' Creed that we have uh, listed there. But make sure you pause for each of the questions that I lift up. But these are the important questions for you. Some of you have been baptized. Some will be baptized at the date we're setting, but if you've only been baptized as an infant, I'd ask for you to, to answer these questions and the following ones uh, that I will lift up. Do you, in the presence of God in this congregation, renew the solemn vow and promise that was made at your baptism? If so, answer, I do. Uh, then I ask you these, uh, do you truly and earnestly repent of your sins? If so, answer, I do. Now we share the Apostles' Creed together as a demonstration of our faith. And just uh, put my hand up for one minute to pause. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and in one of our Methodist hymnals, we heard the words, Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you pledge your allegiance to his kingdom? 
If so, answer, I do. Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament? If so, answer, I do. And finally, do you promise, according to the grace given you, to keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in the same all the days of your life as faithful members of Christ's holy church? If so, answer, I do. All right. You may be seated at this time. We're going to call you up uh, individually. Dave, will you join me on this? At some point in June, by the way, we will hold a baptism, and that will be at Barney Lake, and we're working on the details, but it looks like the third Sunday in June, right after church, we normally have a picnic with that, and uh, that's been a tradition, I think, early for a long time, I think, to do that, so uh, you're welcome to join, whether you have a young one participating, or you just want to come and be a part of it, or you want to be baptized yourself, let us know that, too. You can call them up in order. You'll call them up in order that the uh, certificates are there. Sure. Christine and I'll try it. And Christine, I'm going to ask you to open the down one step. I'm going to ask you at this time to go kneel, and I'm going to lay my hand on you and pray with you. And that's a symbolism of understanding the Holy Spirit is on you. And we'd like to have uh, anyone, that, the family that would like to stay in with Christina. Uh, as well. And then I'm going to lift up a prayer and then Dave's going to lift up a prayer for you, alright? Can you kneel in carefully? Christina Bob Snyder, I and the, the Lord defend you with His heavenly grace and by His Spirit confirm you in the faith and the fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we thank you for Christina's life. Thank you for her searching heart that is, is searched deeply for you, and we pray that she might find you, especially in the presence of Jesus Christ, your, your Son, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask your hand to be upon her. Lord, it's a, been a joy to come to know Christine a little deeper during our confirmation class and see the searching in our heart and to see the creativity and artistic ability that you've given to her. We ask, Lord, that you magnify this and she can use these gifts and talents to glorify you. Amen. And all of God's people said. Lexi Nopsnyder. <laughs> Dave knows more of these kids for a longer time than I have. And we praise the Lord for all his track ones. I know he's close to them. Sure enough. <laughs> Lexi Knox Snyder, the Lord defend you with his heavenly grace, and by his spirit confirm you the faith and the fellowship of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. Lord God, I ask your, that your Holy Spirit would be upon uh, Lexi, and your grace would be upon her to lead her and guide her, and that your spirit would give her strength as she ever lives to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for the special times that we've had together through uh, church, the activities here, and also uh, former and present hurdlers have a certain meaning about them. It's been a joy to uh, see her work up her knees and ankles and be, becoming a hurdler. And being a hurdler for you, Lord, is what's important. So we thank you for the life and the presence that she has on the team and that the life that she may use to greatly in you. Amen. And all of God's people said,
and the fellowship of all the disciples of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we thank you for the heritage of faith that we have within families. But we know, Lord, that that, that doesn't ultimately flow from human blood. It flows from Christ's blood and from his spirit that makes uh, each generation a generation that loves the Lord on their own. And we thank you, Lord, for gathering. And we pray that you will broaden his heart, give him a deep, abiding love for Jesus Christ in his own heart. And that not only would the blessings flow from, from ages back to him, but that most blessings may flow from him to, to ages back and to times of death. But we thank you for Gavin and what I've seen of his heart. It's so very clear when we talk and we discuss things and we talk about participation in church activities. It just thrills my heart to be a small part in that really process. And I just ask, Lord, that you continue to grow Gavin and to, to use him, whether it's in the athletic field or within the church realm or in, in the community, because he certainly has a heart to give. So thank you for the experience we've had with him, Lord. And you be all the glory. And all of God's people said. Dylan.
Brothers and sisters, I commend to your love and care these persons whom we this day receive in the membership of this congregation. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. When, and when you add, when you uh, do your vow, make sure you add witness after our uh, presence, our gift service, and witness. We rejoice to recognize you as members of Christ's Holy Church and bid you welcome to this congregation of the United Methodist Church. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service and witness. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that surrounded by steadfast love, you may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Hear this final blessing. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Can you guys stand again and face the congregation? Can you welcome these, these folks? Amen.
We're hearing some rumbling, so Dave's going to be checking. Maybe the Holy Spirit. One time I was preaching and I mentioned about my, my dad and his sermon about the power of the Holy Spirit. It was a bright, sunny day and the lights went off. And they come back on. And that was pretty amazing. <laughs> Uh, and we experienced that. But we, uh, let me just uh, uh, continue just to lift up these concerns that we have raised besides Ron's, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we continue with me in, in spirit of prayer. Dear Lord God, we ask that you be with the concerns we have raised. We pray that as Chip and lifted up Nellie, and we pray for uh, Ken's grandson and Ray's son, uh, Jace. Chase, that you'd be with him, and uh, we ask that you would be with Ron, even as he's been anointed and prayed over, and our whole confirmation class, you would bless and keep all of them as well, and Lord, we um, ask all these things in Jesus' name, and we pray even as you have directed us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I guess they were moving some carts downstairs, but that's okay. We can take rumblings of the Holy Spirit if we, if we put that. I want to ask for the kids to come out real quick, uh, children's time. And uh, anybody would like to come up for children's time? I have some really old books to show you guys. The message of the sermon today is we live our lives like a tale that is told. And we have a lot of things in books. I have I like collecting older books and a lot I got from my dad. This is actually a United, this is a Methodist discipline from 1825. Look how little it was. The one that they're putting together out of Portland, Oregon, will be a whole lot bigger than this. And probably not as clear on how to live for Christ. But that's really an old uh, book, 1825. And then this book, I use sometimes in confirmation too, is a, this is a book about Sitting Bull, the Indian chief. But I was kind of shocked and uh, I can show you guys. They always use a paper to, to bind the back of a book. But this kind of shocked me. Can you guys can you just read on there and see what kind of book you think they use, what kind of paper they use? I think you know what it is. You write it exactly right. It's a, pa a page from the Bible. I was so shocked that this binding fell off of this book about sitting book, and it was a page from the Bible that they used to to bind this book. So even back then, there wasn't maybe as much respect as there should have been for the Word of God um, since that happened. But all of our lives are kind of like a book that God is writing the thing. You ups and your downs, everything you go through is a book that God is writing. And it's a great story if we know what God can bring past. So everybody get in here. We have a nice little group of the girls are all in this room. Let's all get in the prayer huddle. And say a little prayer for those penguins. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> All right. Little black boy birds, I call them. <laughs> All right, let's power in. You'll join us in the upper prayer. Dear Lord, Dear Lord thank, you for Jesus. thank you for Jesus. The word that has come to us. Has come to us. Thank, you for the Bible. thank you for the Bible. And thank you for my life. And thank you for my life. Let it be a story. That others can read to learn about you. Amen. Amen. All right, very good. Thank you, guys.
We live our life like a story. And, uh, and then um, I'm going to read a little bit from Luke's Gospel in a little bit. And then for Max here, we know that there were four Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you went to the streets of Los Angeles and asked that question, then probably most people get it wrong. Because most people don't know about the Bible like we, like, like we did in the past. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke wrote first his Gospel titled with his name, and then he wrote the book of the Acts. So he wrote two books, really, that had two stories, the first about Jesus, the second about the work of the Holy Spirit, which both of them have a lot to do with us, and I'm going to lift that up in a moment. But uh, stories are so important, aren't they? And like even, I, I love movies and I love good books, because there always seems to be some divine principles with God's teaching. Amen? Have you ever watched, you know, Star Wars, obviously, the battle between good and evil. And almost every book or every movie you read, there's some divine story that's unfolding there. And even for the things that you wouldn't often think of, um, this uh, just recently it came out again with the Jungle Book movie. Has anybody seen the, the new Jungle Book movie? Okay, one, you know, one beside me. Okay, well, we'll tell you the whole story so we ruin it for you. <laughs> no, I won't do that. But it's really kind of an interesting history in the Burns household because my son Stephen, who's 29 years old, when he was about a year and a half old or almost two, the Jungle Book Disney movie came out. Do you remember that one? So the Jungle Book Disney movie came out, and Stephen loved it so much. This would have been before we got to Shanksville, when we were up in Wheatville, right before we came to Shanksville. But Stephen was about, like I said, one and a half or two. And he would go into the TV room, he'd get his little yellow plastic chair, he'd set his yellow plastic chair down, he would go around the front of sit down, he'd go, Mommy, jump book movie. <laughs> this happened every day for an entire month and a half. You know, once he got on something, he was, he was on it. So he wanted to watch the Jungle Book every single day for a month and a half. So he would get his little yellow plastic chair, set it down, sit down, and call for Judy for the Jungle Book movie. Well, he would sit transfixed. So, you know, we'd start then talk about the bare necessities of simple things. You know, the things were just, to this day, I can't get those songs out of my head. Because that was something that Stephen really enjoyed. And you know, there was lessons in that even the Disney version of the Jungle Book that come through. Well, the more recent one, I would, you would probably agree that there's some deep lessons in that movie, too, that, um, in that story. And it's kind of darker. Was it a little bit darker than you thought? Yeah. <laughs> it was a little darker. It's still funny and good, and I just would think about it with the kids and all. But I thought, well, maybe the real Jungle Book is like that. Maybe it's a little darker. Maybe. But it still pointed out some great principles. One of them was respect for humility, because Mowgli was taught by those around him in the animal kingdom that the, the elephant was to be really respected. So whenever the elephants were present, everyone would bow down, and even Mowgli bowed down and, um, and learned a deep lesson. Later, the elephants were to appreciate him for a reason. You'll find out about that if you see it. But there were these important lessons in the law of the path, things to follow and guidance to have. So we kind of realize that stories are so important. And that's why the Bible is so important. And, and we have right here from Acts, I'll read right along with you, Acts 1.1. Remember, Luke uh, spoke about writing the book of Luke, the Gospel of Jesus. Then he says this here in Acts, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, in the next verse, until the day he was taken up after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them in many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. This, he said, is what you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
So there you have Luke talking about this account now of the Acts of the Apostles, which could be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, because the, the Apostles wouldn't have been nothing, wouldn't have been anything without the empowerment and the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to keep this very short, I assure you, because I know we're right along with time. But it, I just want you to hear the beginning of the book of Luke, because here he says, just listen, Luke 1.1, 1, 1, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me to also having a have perfect understanding of all the things from the very first to write you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things which you were instructed. What Luke does here is he says through the gospel and through the acts of the apostles, he says, I want to deliver to you an orderly account, an authoritative account of Jesus and then of the Holy Spirit. And so Luke unfolds the gospel of Christ, Matthew unfolds the gospel of Christ, um, Mark unfolds the gospel of Christ, John unfolds the gospel of Christ, all because they want to give an authoritative account of Jesus' life. You know this word is only used once in the entire Bible, this Greek word, diahedromai, it means to lead you through, to lead you through where you need to go. And that's why it's so powerful because Luke here says, I want to give you a thorough narrative. I want to be able to lead you through life with, by the story of Jesus and by the, works, the work of the Holy Spirit. Now how important is Jesus' story? Jesus' story is very important to us, but to the world around us, not so much anymore. You know, there's always been some respect of Jesus, but I think if I'm starting to see even a wrinkling to the effect of how whether people respect Christ or not. Have you seen that? Well, just say, oh, he was just a figure a long time ago. His story doesn't really matter. There's an old poem I love. It's called One Solitary Life. Let me read it here. It says, um, there was a man who was born in an obscure village, a child of a peasant woman, grew up in another village. He worked as a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. Never held an office. Never had a family. Never went to college. Never put his foot inside a big city. Never traveled two, more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. Never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials about himself. While still young, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He's turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of the trial, was nailed upon a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property that he had, which was his coat. And when he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Yet, the writer of the poem says, 19 centuries have come and gone, and today he is the centerpiece of the human race, the leader of the column of progress. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned and were put together have not affected life of man upon earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. You cannot deny Jesus Christ his story. It's just you can't, you shouldn't be able to turn away from it. Amen? <laughs> You shouldn't turn, and that's why you guys, as a confirmation class, and adults becoming members, once you're presented Jesus, you, you shouldn't be able to turn away from him. I ran into somebody down in Rockwood during the garage sale days, and I didn't know he was a Christian, and he started, he had a bunch of Christian books, Lee Strobel's Case for Christ, and I'm looking over all his books. I said, oh, it's amazing, you're a believer. He said, yeah, I'm a believer. And I said, well, I'm a new pastor, you know, here in Rockwood and in Milford, so I got to meet somebody who wouldn't have known before. Um, I, didn't, I didn't even ask him what his church was. I know I'll meet him again, I'm sure, and if he doesn't have a church, hopefully you'll feel welcome in our church. But it was really cool because as I talked to him, 
He said, you know, I finally heard about Jesus, and just like the Bible says, it was like scales fell off my eyes. It's like I finally heard Jesus' story, and I understood it, and I accepted it. And he had that, you know that little fiery, crazy look at Christians? I'm kind of glad he had that little crazy look. And my dad snorted and stalked and we got to be excited about something, amen? You know, and that's what, I, I will never be ashamed of Jesus. And if he doesn't put some kind of fire in you, if his story doesn't put some kind of fire in your story, then something's wrong. Amen? And this is what's interesting, and I'm, I'm bringing this around to close here. The book of Acts is, Luke says, you know, Theophilus, I gave you one story. Now let me tell you another story. Jesus promised he would send the Holy Spirit, and he backed it up. And then Paul. And then Luke goes through and tells the whole story of the acts of the Holy Spirit through the book of Acts, of the Acts of the Apostles. He gives us a thorough account of what the Holy Spirit came to do. This is Pentecost Sunday. You know, we're not here just for Jesus Christ. We're here for the whole Trinity. Amen? Amen? Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. A lot of people say, well, I can't live the Christian life. That's because you've been trying to live it on your own. You aren't living it with the Holy Spirit. When we lay our hands on these kids up here, you guys, I lay my hands on you. What we believe is, receive ye the Holy Spirit. We believe that God, because you have faith, God sent His Spirit upon you. The Spirit Jesus promised. So you could, so you could live the Christian life. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. They were all ready to serve. They just didn't have what they needed to serve. And I like to tell people this. Why would any of us be afraid of the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit wants to do two things for you? He wants to give you the nature of Jesus, and he wants to give you the power of Jesus to do his work. Why would you ever be afraid to have the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control of Jesus? Amen? <laughs> How many times have you been in church and you didn't see the fruits of the Spirit? I've been there, those kind of meetings. I wasn't seeing the nature of Jesus in what comes, but that's why we need the Holy Spirit. He wants to, if Luke said, I want to give you a thorough account of Jesus' life, don't you think the Holy Spirit wants to do a thorough work in your life? Amen? He wants to do a thorough work in your life. He wants to start where you are and give you all that he has. I always tell people it's like, I really think a good illustration of living the spirit-filled life is, you know, a lot of people say, I have Jesus, I don't need the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus promised you that he would baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So you better be ready to receive whatever he has for you. You know, it's Jesus' presence. So I told people, if you to somebody, just think of a bag of balloons like a church. And you, and you toss a bag of balloons to somebody and you say, blow these up. And so somebody goes, okay, blow that one up. You know, you know when you blow up a balloon and it's just that little poop? You know, when it gets hard, it starts getting hard to blow it up. Well, it's full, right? It is a full balloon. If you want to be legalistic about it, it's a full balloon. You know, and people say, I have all of Jesus that I need. Well, you don't have all of Jesus that you can have, so how, how can you have all that you need? So, can you imagine if we strung up a bunch of little half blown up balloons around it? Woo! Let's have a party! People go, Where are the balloons? They're up there, can't you see them? <laughs> oh, I think I see them. They're not very bright. And they don't look very joyful like the balloons are supposed to. They're not blowing around in the wind. Well, that's because they're less than what they should be. <laughs> I want to be all, I want to have everything that Jesus has for me. Amen? I think we're afraid to be filled with the Holy Spirit because we're afraid we're going to break. Maybe you're going to break for somebody to break for the Lord. Amen? And those balloons can take a while. But we can be filled with the presence of Jesus. And then we can make a difference in the world around us. I think everybody, it's kind of interesting, I think everybody is living kind of a cautious life. And that includes us in the church. I think we're, I think we're living a cautious life. I wanted to 
to find something here if I can. No, no. I think it, I have. I think we're living such a cautious life. You know, we don't want to step on anyone's toes. We don't want to get too committed because that might be, I might have to, something might happen to me if I get too committed or if I believe too strongly about something. We're like that politically, and I think that we're like that as Christians. And I found a poem by Theodore Roosevelt. I'm going to close with this, actually. And we, sh we could use some candidates like Theodore Roosevelt for president, couldn't we? His kind of courage. Listen to what he wrote. And every one of our confirmation kids, you should live your life this way, just regular life, but you should live it spiritually and special. So this is what Roosevelt wrote. He said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how a strong man stumbled or whether the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in, in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, and who strives violently, who errs, um, and who gets short and comes up short again and again, because there's no effort without air. And who knows great enthusiasms and great devotions, and who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end of triumph there is high achievement. And at the very worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly to try. So that his place shall never be among those cold and timid souls who neither knew uh, victory nor defeat. You know, Roosevelt was talking about regular life, not talking about spiritual life. It's time for you to get into the arena. Amen? That's where it's, that's where it's, your face gets dusty and marble sweat and blood, but at least you're doing something for the Lord. Amen? You, God is writing a thorough account of your life so that you might serve his kingdom. Be by your head with me. Dear Lord God, we thank you so much for our confirmation class. They certainly are being asked by you to, to trust in Jesus as their Savior and also to be filled with the Holy Spirit as we have laid hands upon them and pray, pray that you continue to pour out your Holy Spirit upon them. Let them be an open vacuum, willing to receive. And Lord, then let us be um, Roosevelt men and women and young people. Let us in a spiritual way, let us place ourselves in the middle of the arena that we might fight and live for you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen. We're going to close, I think, with just the response of our heart because he lives there. So will you stand with me as we sing our closing song? <laughs>